Welcome to the literature review session for the graduate research series. This series is co-sponsored by the Division of Research and Graduate Studies and ECU Libraries. My name is Jeannie Hoover and I'm the Science Librarian. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, a brief overview of what literature reviews are. And my name is Tamara Rhodes, I'm the Online Learning Librarian, and I'm going to go into how do you find those articles to create a literature review. So what are literature reviews? You can find them in every discipline and they are part of the research process. You'll find them in grants, theses, and articles, as well as books. The thing to remember is that liter literature is always evolving. There's always new research being published at a given time. A literature review is not an annotated bibliography and it's not just a summary. What you do is you summarize, evaluate, and synthesize a body of literature. Basically, you're going to try to find the loose ends on a specific topic. Why is your project needed or what is different about your research project than what has been published before? You're basically setting up the stage for your research project. One thing that can be helpful to you is to think of it as um, telling a story. You're telling a story of what research has been done in the past and you're setting up the stage to sort of explain your new approach or your research. The literature review will provide a general overview of a body of research. It will also reveal what research has already been done. This can also help you figure out new ideas to use in your research, and it can also show you what flaws or weaknesses um, are existing in the research today. It is also a way to show people your knowledge of um, a given topic, and this is important in your theses and dissertations for your uh, advisors. There was a research study done called, it's a PhD, not a Nobel Prize, by Mullins and Kiley in Australia. And what they actually looked at were um, how PhD theses and dissertations were evaluated and how people reading them, how enjoyable it was to read or how difficult it was to actually follow the paper. And what they found is that most readers decided whether or not to continue reading the paper after the literature review. So this is a key part of your thesis or dissertation. Um, you want to make it engaging and interesting so that people will want to know why your research is different, how it fits in with the greater knowledge that there is already. So one of the most common questions is, where do you stop? And that can be really hard to decide whether or not um, you should continue doing your literature reviews if you have enough research, as well as you know, when can you finally stop? And this is probably the most stressful part of the literature review process. So there are a few ways that you can look at it. I like to think of it as a pyramid. Um, you can get really comprehensive or you can go to the top of the pyramid and be pretty selective of your literature review. And this depends on the type of literature review that you're writing. So are you writing it for a thesis, a dissertation, just a paper? Um, are you writing it for a review article or for a grant? All of these literature reviews are just a little bit different in scope, so you just want to make sure that you are addressing it according to the paper that you're writing. Dr. Harris Cooper of Duke University has done a lot of research on doing literature reviews, so you can always follow up with his work and his publications if you need more information. He breaks down literature reviews into four general topics, from comprehensive to selective. The first one is exhaustive reviews. These are comprehensive and that includes everything that's published on a given topic. That will include everything from journal articles to dissertations to um, gray literature. So that can take a lot of time, but it's very comprehensive. The next step down is an exhaustive review with selective citations. And this is still pretty extensive, but you're limiting your citations in some manner, whether it's by a type of publication like journal articles or some other um, limitation. The next one is representative works. And with this, you pick a group of citations that represent the broader scholarly knowledge on a topic. Uh, this can be challenging because it's hard, it can be challenging to pick the most representative works, but it is a little bit more selective in scope. And then finally, the most selective that you can get is a central sample approach. 
And what is hard with this one is you're picking out specific examples, um, but you want to explain why you picked those articles and why you excluded others. And with that, you would just state why some articles were excluded from your literature review. So finally, am I done yet? You want to make sure that you have been through all the literature. You definitely want to try a few databases and not stay within one database because you may be missing a piece of work. But what you'll see as you go through the literature, you'll start seeing articles pop up over and over again as well as um, specific faculty or researchers names pop up over and over again. And once you start getting into that circle, that can help you decide that you've done a comprehensive search and there really isn't much on um, much more on your topic. Some other things that you want to do, um, you definitely want to check with your advisor to see if there are articles or books that you're missing from your literature review. They can really help you as far as gearing you to um, researchers who are focused within that field that you are doing your work in. So definitely talk to them. Again, search multiple databases. Don't limit yourself to one database. Take advantage of the Writing Center who can help you um, structure a literature review, who can help you with citations. And then some other things that you may want to look at. We have a number of research method books in our collection, and a lot of them are focused within disciplines. So there might be one for social sciences, there might be one for sciences, um, even as specific to psychology or social work. So that can really help you as far as explaining what a literature review would be in that field, as well as sort of ways to get to write them. Some other things that you can do, you can look at review articles. Those are just a giant literature review of a given topic, and that can be a really good way to get the feel of how people present um, a literature reviews in the scholarly field. We have a database called Annual Reviews, and that database is just completely filled with review articles. So you can go into that database and just search a topic and read through it, and that can give you a good idea of how you might want to organize your literature review. And then finally, we do have a Graduate 101 research guide, and this research guide has a tab specifically on literature reviews, and that can help you understand literature reviews some more. Now that you've learned from Jeannie exactly what literature reviews are, I'm going to go through the process of finding those, that literature, finding those articles and books that you might need to create this literature review. So the overall things I'm going to go over, I'm going to review the steps of the research process, identify research tools that you may be able to use, identify pertinent databases to locate articles, theses and dissertations, etc., and then show you some ways to construct advanced searches to find more of these articles that you might not be finding with simple searches. So the research process is made up of a few steps. First, you want to define your topic. Some questions to ask yourself. What do I know about a topic? What do I not know about a topic? What do I need to learn to get my hypothesis? What terminology do I need to learn? What kind of sources and or data do I think I need? And is my topic narrow enough? So these are all questions that you want to ask yourself as you're defining your topic and um, sort of forming that. The next one is gathering background information. So this is the second step of the research process. In order to gather background information, you want to define terminology. Um, learn about specific methodologies, get a general overview of a topic, um, and you can get all this information from su subject encyclopedias, basic books, and even some journal articles will start off with uh, background information about the topic that they're going to get into. When you're gathering background information, keep in mind that the purpose of this is not only to give you a grounding in what you're going to be researching, but also using this as an opportunity to generate a list of keywords or brainstorm keywords. The purpose of this is to devise words that you can use for your search when you're searching for researches on a topic. So as you're going through this background information, you might see that there are multiple words that other people use for your topic. So when you go into searching and evaluating resources, you'll have this entire list of keywords that you can search for. So if you have a combination of two or three words and you run out of sources and you're not finding more, you can switch out those keywords that you've already brainstormed beforehand. And then finally, after you search and evaluate your resources, you're going to write and cite your paper or write your annotated bibliography or your literature review. 
When you're evaluating resources, there are some key things that you need to keep in mind as evaluation criteria. What are you looking for? You're looking for credibility. Now this is the author's credentials and evidence of quality control. So usually uh, with scholarly articles, which are those articles that are um, written by experts or professors, professionals in this specific topic, they're going to tell you who that author is, but also where they're affiliated with. Do you want to check for those credentials to make sure that they're a credible, um, authoritative source for information? Evidence of quality control is in those scholarly articles, the reason they are also called peer-reviewed is that they, they're not automatically published. Usually that article would be sent to other peers or other experts on the topic who go through that article with a fine-tooth comb and make sure that everything is accurate and that it is an authoritative source that can be published. So you want to look for credibility. The next thing is accuracy. You want to look at timeliness, comprehensiveness, the audience and purpose. Who is it written for and why was it written? Next, you want to look at reasonableness. So you want to pay attention to the fairness, the objectivity, how moderate it is, its consistency, and its worldview. So is it very opinionated or is it just presenting the facts and the data? Usually with scholarly articles, they're just presenting facts. They're not going to give you their opinion like uh, editorial pieces in a magazine would. And lastly, you want to look at support. You want to look for sources of documentation or references, which would usually happen at the end of an article. Um, does it have an extensive bibliography? And are those sources actually credible, accurate, reasonable? So go through those um, evaluation criteria for the sources of the article you're looking at. Also, you want to look at corroboration and external consistency. Is that same information being, is it also being represented in other articles on the same topic? Are other people getting that same conclusion? The first thing when you're starting out with your library research, you want to always start at the library homepage. This is um, a great place to start because we have pretty much everything you'll need here. One of those things is Ask a Librarian. How do you ask for help when you need it? If you hover over Ask Us, you will see all the ways that you can contact a librarian for assistance. So we have an email address. You can launch chat with us, and we also have a phone number you can call or you can schedule a research consultation. This is, uh, you can sit down with us one-on-one -on -one forever how long you need, and we will help you through your topic, either defining that topic or where to gather that background information, help you generate a list of keywords, just help you go through that research process. If you are stuck in your research, you're not, you feel like you're not finding anything else, come see us, come schedule a research consultation. Um, what you'll do is you'll click on this button here, fill out the form, tell us your topic, and we'll get back to you and schedule a time with you. And we'll help you sit down and um, figure out what you need and where you need to get it. Another key point on our library homepage is find databases. So Jeannie said to make sure to use several different da databases. I know a lot of students just use the OneSearch box, but we have databases that are specific to subjects. So the OneSearch box doesn't cover everything, and it doesn't cover a subject very in-depth. So you might want to go into Find Databases, just click on that, and look for your subject. So say we're going to Sociology. These are all of our databases that pertain to Sociology. They are going to have information that may be more in-depth into the topic, into the subject area, than the OneSearch box. So these are all great ways to deepen that literature review if you feel like you're not getting everything you need. Another place to go is you can use this one search box to access our library catalog. It does include the full scope of our catalog as far as books. If you want to search for books on your specific topic, you can do that here. I know a lot of students are averse to using books because you actually have to pick them up and go get them. but Books are great because they give you a more in-depth look at a certain topic. So within a certain book, you may have that background information, you're going to have um, specificity in that topic, all in one resource, um, as opposed to an article where they're just looking at one little tiny piece of one subject and they're going to go into that um, in depth. So you can look for our books here on the OneSearch box. And then lastly, our Find eJournal eBook titles. This is our portal where you can look up specific journals. 
So say you know of a specific journal from an article you found and you want to just search in that article in that journal for more articles like it. You can type in your journal name here and then it'll tell you all of the places where you can find that. You can even just type in a subject. So I'm just going to type in sociology and see what journals I get. And you can see everything here. So say I'm interested in sociology and development. I'm interested in that journal. This is telling me that it's in Social Index, which is one of our sociology databases. So if I click on that, it'll take me directly to that database. And this one only has a range from 1988, but it'll list all the issues that we do have access to at Joiner Library. It'll list that here, and you can click on a specific issue and go within it. But you can also click search within this publication, and you can type in your search terms and search within that journal for your specific topic. So again, if you already know the journal you want to go into, this is a great resource to do that. So we've gathered our background information, and then we want to generate those um, list of keywords. If we go back to our slideshow here, this is a chart giving you an example of how to brainstorm these keywords. The dark red, the burgundy at the top, those are the keywords that maybe we came up with on our own. So what we're going to do is think of synonyms, other versions of the word, maybe get a little bit more specific. So for education, maybe we look up students, or we'll specify it and look up public schools in particular, or charter schools, alternative schools, elementary, secondary. For methodology, instead of just putting method, maybe look up the specific methodology that you're looking for. Qualitative data, case studies, focus groups. Another thing you want to look at, synonyms. Instead of death, maybe you want to look up a specific type of death, like suicide, or die, dying, versions of these words. For grief, sadness, depression, these are all synonyms. This is what you would do beforehand, before you even get to the library databases, in order to sort of deepen your search when you get to that point. Now, we have some search strategies. When you go into a library database, it's not like Google where you would just put in a long sentence or a long stream of words. There are keywords or connectors. Um, they're things we call Boolean operators. These are things you can put in between each keyword you come up with to narrow or broaden your search and get those deeper articles that are further in the database. You have your keywords, which are usually nouns or the key concepts of your topic. They're not going to include the words in or the because that's just going to complicate the search. You want to just get down to the root of what your actual topic is. What you'll do is if you want to narrow your search. So for example, let's say you're doing research on global warming. You want to know about global warming and the sea level and California. What it's saying is it's going to search the database for articles that include all three of those terms, global warming, sea level, and California. It's narrowing my search. So what if I notice that another term for global warming is greenhouse effect? If I want to broaden my search to include articles that don't just say global warming, but also they may say greenhouse effect, I can open it up and say global warming or greenhouse effect, and it would look for articles that include both of those terms. If I use both of those together or an and, I could do global warming or greenhouse effect, and sea level and California. So it's going to include all four of those words. Now the not Boolean is to exclude certain articles. Say that I'm looking up global warming and sea level and I'm getting tons of things about California. That's the west coast. What if I want to know about the east coast? I would put in not. So I would say global warming and sea level, not California. Now my results are going to have everything about global warming and sea level but it's going to take out all those articles that mention California, but may include some of those articles about the East Coast. Those are Boolean operators. Another tip for a stronger search, for a deeper search, is you can enclose your search terms, your search phrases, in quotation marks. So if I'm searching global warming, if I just put in global warming, it's going to search for global anywhere in an article, and then warming anywhere in an article. 
If I want to make sure that that phrase is together, I can put it in quotation marks telling the system that global warming has to be right next to each other in my results. Another example here is higher education. That's telling it I want higher education right next to each other in every result that I get. Another search strategy, truncation. Truncation is just a fancy word for the asterisk that is behind the example there for parent. Say you want to look up articles about parents. You may get articles that say parent, parents, parental, or parenting. In order to do one search to get all of those included, you'll break it down to the very root of the word, which is parent, and then put an asterisk behind it. That's going to give you all of those different endings of the words in your search results. And lastly, keep in mind of controlled vocabulary. These are specific terms that databases or authors use to identify their work. If you're looking in a database for something about, um, in your mind you have your topic, you want to research kids. You can't type in kids, well you could, but you may not get what you're looking for because that's not an identifiable controlled vocabulary. So children might be one, or youth, or teenagers. Those might be more accurate controlled vocabulary. A way to get these words is a lot of databases have the SORI that you can look in. So let's go back to a database here. We'll go to PsycInfo and show you what this thesaurus will look like. So here at the top, it says thesaurus. So if you click on that, say I want to look up recidivism, which is the rate at which um, people return back to prison. I look up recidivism. Okay. And hit browse. So it's got my term here. Um, it looks like it's a term that's used because it's in blue and it's underlined. But if I click on that, it also gives me other terms that I can use, and it tells you what it's doing. So a broader term might be a criminal antisocial behavior in general. Related terms, criminal record, criminals, these are other terms that I could put in the database to search and maybe get articles that talk about recidivism. Now these thesauri are included in a lot of different databases. Some of them call them different things. If we went to CINAHL, which is a health database, it's called a very different thing in there. But at the top here, we have CINAHL headings. This is the same thing as a thesaurus, but CINAHL has subject headings, which is that controlled vocabulary. So if you click on that, you can put in your term here. Um, let's search nutrition. And here we go, alternate versions for that word. So nutrition, adolescent nutrition, child nutrition disorder, so other things related to that. And if I click explode, oh maybe not. Here we go. If I click on the word, I've got diet in there, so maybe this is another word I want to look at. One database, for instance, that does not have a thesaurus is JSTOR, but usually a lot of different databases do have that thesaurus, usually in the top bar up here. Lastly, I want to show finding articles that have been published is a great way to find research, but also look at other thesaurus, I mean other theses and dissertations because your topic might be included in there. So if I'm at the database list, over on the find databases on the right hand side under theses and dissertations, these are the databases we have that include that, um, those um, research articles. So we've got everything at ECU in this database. We've also got um, scholarship is anyone associated with ECU. So that could include professors, students, anyone who puts their um, their research articles can enter it in scholarship. And then also we have ProQuest, which will include dissertations and theses from anywhere. You can go in these databases much like um, any other database, put in your topic, and then you'll get just theses and dissertations on a specific topic. One thing to keep in mind is uh, full text availability. 
Because these are theses and dissertations, sometimes you may find that the full text is not available. Um, this may be because the information is embargoed, which means that um, maybe someone wants to continue with that research. So they've put an embargo on it, which means they don't want anyone to view that article because they're still working on that research. So they don't want anyone to maybe get ideas from it or access it. Keep that in mind when you're looking at these theses and dissertations when you can't find the full text. That's all I have for research process and how to find these articles for your literature review. If you ever need any help, remember to ask a librarian. Ask us on that library homepage. Schedule a consultation with us. We'll sit down with you and help you work through your research.